Hey all here OS Reviews. Today we're taking a closer look at the Unihertz TikTok. This is a unique smartphone because it has a secondary display there on the back. Shows off time as well as notifications. You can use it as a viewfinder for the camera and it's like a clock. In fact, similar to a smartwatch strapped onto the back of the phone. And though it might not be to everyone's cup of tea, it's definitely distinctive and unique, something that seems to be a trend among all of Unihertz phones that they've released so far. Some of their eclectic offerings in the past included the Titan, which is one of the only modern smartphones running on Android these days with a keyboard, almost like a modern Blackberry, along with the Jelly Phone that was one of the world's smallest Android smartphones that can fit in the palm of your hand. The TikTok, I would say it's the most normal phone, quote unquote, out of their releases so far in the sense that at least it does have a pretty full-sized 6.2 inch display. So compared to the Jelly or Titan, for instance, you don't get a smaller screen compared to average phones these days. Now in terms of specs, the TikTok is also one of the most powerful phones from Unihertz, but in the market, it still is a mid-end phone. It's using the MediaTek Dimensity 700 processor, which is a pretty capable chipset. It's comparable to new Qualcomm Snapdragon chips, also in the 700 series. It's backed by 8 gigabytes of RAM, 128 gigs of built-in storage, further expandable, as well as support supports 5G bands because of the Dimensity 700 chip. Otherwise, as you can tell by the design of this device, it is pretty chunky because of the rubber accents and these kind of strange sharp edges at the top and bottom. It does in fact have IP68 water resistance, so you can dump it in water uh, and it should still survive. It also has underneath the hood a 6000 milliamp hour capacity battery, which is gigantic and luckily will power this phone for about two days on average, if not longer if you're lighter on phone usage. So taking a closer look at the design, again, the whole name is just because of that display. It's not related to the social media TikTok app. Uh, the crown here is etched in aluminum. You can double tap on the rear screen to wake it up. I should mention though that a rear display is not necessarily a new concept. And just for comparison, here it is next to the aforementioned Meizu Pro 7, again with that rear display that we had also seen from a couple years back. So it has a kind of similar concept, but this one is just a little bit more discreetly integrated. Not to mention foldable phones, when it is flipped open, still it is a pretty novel feature in the general landscape of mobile phones. Now the rear here also houses a 48 megapixel camera with a dual tone LED flash, but unfortunately the other part here is just for decorative purposes. There is no ultra wide. Definitely not going to be the most versatile setup in the world, but still has a pretty high resolution count. This carbon fiber texture on the back though is very grippy. The phone feels very substantial and solid in the hands, also thanks to the metal rails that they're using on the side, which also houses the power key slash fingerprint scanner, which is very fast. There's also dedicated volume keys, and I really like how on the other side you'll find two additional shortcut keys that can be remapped to open any program that you desire, but out of the box, the bottom one here can turn external display on or off, which is useful, and the top one is mapped by default to open the flashlight when you're long holding for a few seconds, which is also quite good. These keys, again, are made out of metal. The only thing that is a little bit disappointing is it's a mono speaker located on the back of the phone. So in terms of music playback, it's not going to be the best experience in the world. Although, again, you are able to technically control things like music directly from that rear screen. So if you are playing it face down, for instance, that might still be all right. And aside from the micro SD slash SIM card slot, the bottom here just houses the USB type C charging port. Other standards include NFC for contactless mobile payment. There is also an infrared blaster on the top for controlling TVs and acting as a re universal remote. And the standards including Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, GPS, of course, are all baked in. Now again, taking a look at the front of the phone, it definitely has pretty chunky bezels, but that's pretty much the case with most rugged phones in general. Really though, it's just the shape that makes this thing so weird. They say it's inspired by the hands or points of a clock, proximity light sensor, earpiece, and a front-facing 8 megapixel camera with a water drop notch that, to be honest, maybe is a little bit disappointing. I would have liked them to see this particular camera maybe moved up by just half a centimeter and they wouldn't need to even have a notch here, but it is what it is. But at the very least, it is quite fast to unlock, as you can see there, and it's running on Android 11 out of the box. Taking a closer look at this UI experience, it is relatively clean. Of course, icons are a little bit more personalized than stock, but you don't find too much bloatware on here aside from just the essentials. 
basic sound recorder, universal remote control app, and also a toolbox uh, completes the third-party apps that you find on here, like the compass, a level tool. There's even a built-in barometer that can measure the air pressure around you. So all of these functions though are quite similar to other rugged phones from brands like Humidigi, Doji, so on and so forth that we have seen in the past, but they are located here. Everything else though, again, is quite clean. We have just the standard Google apps, including the Play Store, for you to then download your own content. Now, before we dive all the way in and talk about the performance, let's also take a quick look at some of the accessories you get in the box. And that is inclusive of a SIM card ejector tool. You also get a free tempered glass screen protector included along with the user guide. There is, by the way, also a TPU soft carrying case, which has another kind of synthetic carbon fiber texture to it. USB type C wall adapter for charging, and it's a fast charger that supports up to 33 watts. You'll also find a USB type C cable, pretty standard stuff, along with an adapter for type C to 3.5 millimeters, because unfortunately, like most phones these days, there is no regular headphone jack. This is by no means an ultra compact phone, almost the opposite of their Jelly microphone, but it's similar to other rugged devices. I think to begin with, maybe the most important and unique part about this phone is gonna be that secondary display. So let's take a closer look at that immediately. Under settings, you're able to control things like what type of clock, you want to set on the rear and they give you a pretty nice collection. It is really similar to just any smartwatch and you're able to even add additional dials and customize things like the way that the clock looks like, uh, different hands and dials from digital to analog, and even add your own photo as the background. Other things you can control here include the brightness level of that rear display, as well as things like whether or not you want it to be turned on whenever you flip the phone over. So in fact, let's go through the gestures here. Again, very similar to a smartwatch. You're able to drag down to take a look at your battery percentage remaining. But interestingly, the gestures maybe are not the most intuitive in the sense that you can't drag up again to go to that previous screen. You have to swipe from the left to the right to go back by one panel. Uh, but we can also swipe upwards here to take a look at any missed notifications. And then we can then swipe in a carousel view to go through the widgets, including controlling any music that's being played. You can also access the uh, compass directly we can also access the aforementioned viewfinder, which I do think is one of the more useful applications of a rear display on any phone because you're able to take higher resolution selfies. Interestingly, you can even flip it around to use the basically the front facing camera to also record something on the back, which is a little bit strange. Although it seems like one limitation is you're not able to record video or vlogs directly from this rear display, at least at the moment. And then you can swipe again, it just loops you back. So very simple. So aside from notifications, time, as well as the viewfinder, that is pretty much what this rear display is limited to. You don't get access to the other Android apps, at least here at the moment. Now, one thing I will say though, is that this kind of protrudes from the back of the phone, but it still is raised in terms of this metal crown, uh, which means that when you set the phone down, at least it doesn't really wobble. You can also double tap on this main screen again to change the dials here manually, and then long hold to confirm on which one you want to keep it as. We can take a closer look at the camera here first, and I would say that this is really so-so. It's passable, has enough resolution that your snaps still look quite sharp, but again, not the most versatile camera, and you also don't get too much settings to play around with either, although you can change uh, some basic parameters, such as if you want to capture a raw photo to preserve and further edit the resolution of the image. There's a promo that allows you to change things like white balance and ISO, but that's pretty much it. Again, you're lacking things like a wide angle or even a bokeh mode. Most of these rugged phones on the market, it's not going to be being a photography king that something like a Pixel or iPhone will get you and serve you better in that sense, but it will still be able to preserve all of your memories and basic shots without too much issues. So here's a few examples. In good lighting conditions, your images can still turn out looking quite good. But again, this will definitely degrade as you go into lower light conditions, and it may not be just quite as versatile or consistent as some of the top of the line performers, but still a passable experience, I would say. If you're doing things like video chatting, it's actually able to get a pretty good shot of your surroundings and yourself, also for things like vlogging without having to hold the phone too far away from your face. So it's really, it's not too surprising that things like watching back videos, social media scrolling still feels very fluid and fast thanks to this chipset uh, that they've chosen. In terms of watching back videos, here's a quick demo along with the speaker quality that you can expect.
So overall, I would say it doesn't really sound too tinny or distorted, even at higher volume levels, which is good. Performance quality of the display is also decent, I would say. The sharpness here is nice because of the Full HD resolution. It's an IPS laminated screen, so you do get some pretty generous viewing angles. And brightness is also decent in terms of if you have some sunlight hitting on it, you can still make it out, although it's not going to be quite as glaringly bright as some OLED or AMOLED screens can get. But overall, considering that this is a device that is focused a little bit more on getting you a mid-tier experience. Now speaking of mid-end, that also is reflected in the price, I would say, mostly. It's currently selling for a little bit north of 350 bucks, which definitely isn't ultra-budget like some $200 Android phones we've seen in the past, but you are also getting a little bit more of distinctive design here. Connectivity in terms of 5G antenna bands, as well as Wi-Fi with dual band, also seem to be doing quite well in terms of I was pretty much consistently getting three if not full bars uh, in terms of testing. Pages were loading quickly in terms of connecting to data. And here's a quick demo, for instance, taking a look at a complex web page like The Verge. And you can tell that it's doing quite well in terms of content is quick to load. Maybe you have to wait a split second for all of the web pages uh, videos and ads here to show up, but this is a pretty complex page. So overall, again, day-to-day -day usage certainly isn't a problem in terms of performance. You're not going to find anything to really complain about. Speaking of on this device, it does perfectly fine when it comes to just regular gaming. Even more demanding titles like PUBG or Asphalt will still be able to load and run, but you may have to just slightly lower some of the graphic settings, as well as you can't expect it to, uh, for instance, give you the most flawless or fastest loading speeds versus, say, the Snapdragon HN1 or other more gaming centric phones. Now one thing that is good about the Dimensity 700 though is it is, like I said, pretty energy efficient and I never encountered instances of say thermal throttling, so the entire phone remains overall pretty comfortable to use even for extended sessions with gaming or capturing videos or photos. Never gets really too hot, which is good. So that is more or less it as far as our hands-on review of the Unihertz TikTok. Again, this phone is pretty similar to other rugged phones that we have seen around the same mid-end price range in the past, but what just makes it a little more distinctive is of course that secondary display. So it may not be to everyone's cup of tea, ultimately it may still be a little bit gimmicky, but with that being said, it definitely makes the phone unique and a little bit more fun. So in that sense, I do appreciate what Unihertz is trying to do just by making phones that are a little bit different from the crowd. Thanks for watching this video here at OS Reviews. You can learn more details in the descriptions below. For now, that's been a closer look at the Unihertz TikTok.